This is the Mondo Weiss Podcast. I'm Dave Reed. Before we start today's show, I wanted to let you know about our summer fundraising campaign. Mondo Weiss is an independent, nonprofit news publication. That means we are not driven by corporate interests and are accountable to our readers, the people we cover, and the broader movement to end the Israeli occupation and apartheid system. We still need to raise $40,000. Generous supporters have pledged matching donations, which means your contribution will be instantly doubled. If you appreciate the work we do at Mondo Weiss, please become a donor during this campaign so we can continue to bring you critical coverage of events in and related to Palestine. Visit mondoweiss.net slash donate to make a contribution. Now, on to today's episode. Israel's military invasion of the Janine refugee camp, dubbed Operation Home and Garden, came to an end late Tuesday night. It left at least 12 Palestinians dead and one Israeli soldier. Israel has, predictably, declared the operation a success. They say 120 Palestinians were arrested and weapons caches were destroyed, including bomb-making materials. The Israeli Defense Minister, Yov Gallant, said, quote, In the last two days, we interrupted the weapon production process, seized thousands of bombs, and destroyed dozens of factories, workshops, and laboratories. Our reporters have not yet been able to verify his claim that dozens of locations related to the armed resistance in Janine were destroyed. While the military and political leadership in Israel gloats, Palestinians in Janine are telling a different story of the largest attack on the camp since 2002's Operation Defensive Shield. In this assault, Israel deployed up to 2,000 troops backed by armored vehicles, attack helicopters, and warplanes. They turned family homes into sniper positions. They fired tear gas and live ammunition into hospitals, in one case rendering the emergency room facilities unusable and forcing staff to treat injured people in the building's main hallway. They destroyed large portions of the refugee camp's vital infrastructure, digging up roads throughout the camp with armored bulldozers, knocking out segments of the electrical system, and damaging key water pipelines. As the story from inside the camp emerges, it is clear that this invasion was not an easy one for the region's most powerful military. The resistance groups in the camp appear to have put up a strong defense, preventing the military from exercising full control over the area. Benjamin Netanyahu's government may have thought they would have a repeat of the 2002 invasion. They clearly did not. Today, I'm joined by our Palestine news team to discuss all of these events and what the ramifications are politically for Palestinians, Israelis, and the international community. Yumna Patel is our Palestine news director based in Bethlehem. Faris Jackman is our managing editor in Ramallah. And Tariq Hajaj is our Gaza correspondent based in Gaza City. Yumna, I want to start with you. Can you describe how this invasion ended and what the Israeli withdrawal looked like on Tuesday? Israel has said one soldier died, 23-year-old Sergeant Major David Yehuda Yitzhak. He may have been killed by another Israeli squadron. What are you hearing from contacts in the camp about what they believe Israel's casualties are? Yeah, so after 48 hours, the Israeli military withdrew from Janine. It was actually very early Wednesday morning here in Palestine and Tuesday evening um, in the U.S. After 12 Palestinians had been killed and large-scale destruction had been wreaked on the camp's infrastructure. The Israeli army um, retreated from Janine, obviously declaring a victory from both uh, Israeli politicians and Israeli uh, military generals. In terms of what we're hearing on the ground from Palestinians inside the Janine camp, and particularly Palestinian resistance groups, is that... Following the retreat of Israeli forces from the Janine camp, there was a huge show of support and victory outside of the camp from residents and people in Janine and also um, those affiliated with armed groups in Janine. It was largely, I mean, despite the fact that 12 Palestinians were killed, four of whom were children, it was largely regarded as a victory for the resistance. And I think Ferris will will get more into that later. But in terms of Israeli casualties, there's been, you know, chatter on the ground that people believe Israel isn't letting on um, 
too much or as much as they have suffered in terms of casualties, whether it be injuries or perhaps more, particularly following um, the raid a couple weeks ago when a number of Israeli soldiers were quite severely injured when um, fighters in Janine managed to explode an IED underneath an, an, Israeli, an Israeli military vehicle. So it was an extremely deadly and destructive raid. And yet the Palestinian resistance are saying that they've come out victorious. Um, some folks, some of my colleagues, uh, other Palestinian journalists on the ground in Janine had interviewed um, one of the leaders of the Janine Brigade who said that while the Israeli forces, you know, and they took many pictures of this, while Israeli forces, you know, confiscated some weapons and, and raided some weapons stores inside the Janine refugee camp, the the Janine Brigade is actually saying that they did not actually manage to locate uh, where these weapons are being, uh, or where these IEDs and other weapons are being uh, stored and manufactured, and they're regarding that as a huge success on part of the on part of the resistance. And they're saying that whatever Israeli reports, uh, military, media, um, and politicians are claiming that they they totally destroyed um, the the weapons manufacturers or the the major stores in in the camp. The the resistance is saying that those reports are are untrue. Tarek, I want to bring you in from Gaza. There were a handful of rockets launched from Gaza late Tuesday night after the Israeli withdrawal from the camp. Why was there not a larger response from the Hamas government there and the armed factions in Gaza? Well, I think that the resistance in Palestine is developing. They improve the pattern they fight Israel with. with. Uh, instead of bringing destruction to Gaza, and we know that any attack on Gaza caused huge numbers of civilian casualties, the factions in Gaza try to have some arms in the West Bank and Jerusalem. The Tel Aviv ramming and stabbing operation that was committed by a Palestinian man during the Janin invasion is a clear example of that. Hamas issued a statement right after the operation said that the Palestinian who carried out the operation is affiliated with the Hamas movement. This is one reason. Another one is that Hamas is now being addressed as a government in Gaza, more than a resistance group. And here let me please get back to the in Palestinian history to the 18s and early 19s when the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, used to be a much larger more effective and powerful resistance group than all the factions combined now. But Israel gave them a government in Oslo agreement and became after that the PA, the Palestinian Authority. Now the PA in the West Bank jails Palestinian resistance fighters instead of supporting or resisting alongside with them. In Gaza, the last couple of Israeli attacks were on the BIJ fighters and leaders, not Hamas. Hamas officially didn't engage in these attacks. Maybe they supported the BIJ from under the table with rockets to fire, maybe not, because we have no official statements led by Hamas leaders saying that they fired rockets or did any kind of resistance acts during that attack. But of course, Hamas leads intensive diplomatic and political work to stop the attacks on Gaza. So we can see things change for Hamas, but not for the BIJ. The BIJ and some other factions in Gaza, like the, the PLFP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, humbly respond to the Israeli aggression. They do not want Israel to focus on Gaza and engage in a war in the meantime because Gaza didn't recover from the latest Israeli attack last May that killed 32 people, including six senior leaders of the BIJ in Gaza. In, if Gaza responds, with heavy rockets attack, Israel will also respond with heavier attacks on civilians in Gaza, killing them and turning them to homes. So I think these are the reasons that Gaza resistance group didn't engage in an open fight with Israel this time, basically to avoid people in Gaza from the Israeli and President terror. Yumna, you've interviewed members of the armed resistance groups in Janine over the last year. They are made up largely by very young men, most in their early 20s, some as young as 16. Some of the people taking up arms today were children, even babies, in 2002 when Operation Defensive Shield was carried out. 
Can you talk about some of the fighters you've met and what they've told you about their motivation for joining an armed resistance group? Yeah. So, I mean, the motivation, it's obviously different depending on the person, but largely the main driving force that's motivating these young men, like you said, I mean, some of the, some of the guys that I, that I saw and that I spoke to when I went to Janine, um, most of them early, mid twenties and a lot of teenagers. I mean, teenagers as young, I saw teenagers as young as 15, 16 years old, um, you know, with, with weapons and part of these armed resistance groups, the main motivating factor that they point to is simply the Israeli occupation and the reality that these young men have, have lived under their entire lives. Like you said, Israel completely destroyed and decimated the Janine refugee camp in 2002 in what's known as the Battle of Janine. And many of the young men that are now taking up arms to fight against Israeli forces when they're invading the camp, they were babies or children um, or were growing up or being born soon after that time, right around the Second Intifada. And those were very formative years. And now as they're coming of age, they've They've witnessed the further entrenchment of Israeli apartheid and occupation and a total lack of of hope for any sort of political solution um, and lack of hope for any justice. And so what a lot of the youth are facing in the refugee camp is this choice now. And and one of the young men who who is part of the the Janine Brigade in the camp told me, he said, you know, when we grow up seeing raids every single day, seeing our brothers get killed, our fathers get killed, our friends get arrested, our homes being destroyed, when we see Israel go- coming into our camp and coming going into Palestinian cities and killing people and arresting people every single day, we have no choice but to take up arms. And he 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 put it this way. He said, you know, of course we're going to become fighters and we're not going to become young professionals sitting at desk jobs. And this is the reality facing a lot of the young men in the Janine refugee camp and other refugee camps um, and cities in, in the West Bank today is this feeling that 30 years of a so-called peace process and corrupt leaders has really gotten them nowhere in terms of achieving justice or achieving the right of return back to their their homelands that their families were kicked out of in 1948. And so right now, uh, many of the young people feel that, that, that picking up guns is the only form of, of resistance, that the only avenue for them. Ferris, you've been following developments closely there in Ramallah. Are Palestinians right to see this as a victory against the occupying power? Um, well, I mean, so it does depend on how you define victory. And I think um, on on one level, it was a victory. Um, we can't look at this as being a conventional war. This is a guerrilla war. And in guerrilla war, um, Palestinians who have very little capabilities comparative to the Israeli army um, have really have really made an achievement. Now, that achievement isn't really something that is... Uh, necessarily quantifiable, but it has to do with military strategy and tactics. And I'm no expert in this, but um, this is something that uh, military analysts in the Israeli army are also uh, sort of admitting. One of them is that uh, even from the outset of the operation, the army was trying to downplay the intended scope of the operation. It was about targeting the infrastructure of the resistance and not the fighters themselves. Um, now, why would they really do that? It means that the army isn't really interested in engaging in any sort of direct conflict, an armed skirmish with uh, sold, uh, with uh, Palestinian resistance fighters on the ground. And the reason is because it isn't really to the Israeli army's advantage. Um, uh, you know, the more conventional sort of guerrilla style tactics are usually, you know, you, you, hi- you hide, you choose when you're going to appear, uh, you strike when the moment is right into your favor, and then you retreat when it's, when the battle isn't in your favor. 
And it seems that the Jenin Brigade and the Palestinian resistance fighters in Jenin are kind of conducting themselves in this manner, which is something that is has notably not been the case over the past two years. So we notice a very clear growth. Usually, you know, these operations that would be either in the heart of Nablus or in Jenin, whether targeting the Lion's Den or the Jenin Brigade, usually ended, usually had a pitched battle where the resistance fighters were surrounded based on intelligence from the from the Shabak. And then the resistance fighter would either uh, um, decide to retreat or make a last stand and be martyred in the fight. And usually they choose the latter. Um, so I do. Uh, so I do think that the current sort of performance of uh, the field performance of the Genie Brigade has definitely improved, and I think it also betrays a level of uh, fighting maturity uh, that is uh, that you know we haven't really we haven't really seen in, in well we haven't seen in Janine for twenty years, um, and there's also another thing that you need to that we need to make clear. And this is something that's going to appear in a in an article that we're going to be running uh, later today. Uh, it's a translation from an Arabic article that ran in Hibir. Um, the article basically argues that, first of all, something very interesting: the the size of the force that Israel deployed is basically the same size of the force that was deployed in two thousand and two. During uh, so that was a thousand soldiers, basically an entire brigade, and it's also very notable uh, that most of the fighting the Israeli fighting forces were composed of spe- of elite units, special operations units, not the regu- regular regular uh, sort of conscripts. So, uh, and a big part of the military strategy uh, has been to sort of avoid direct confrontation, uh, avoid direct confrontation, and sort of maintain distance with uh, the Palestinian fighters. Um, now, of course, the the Israelis themselves declared victory, uh, and it's kind of typical that they're going to declare victory. But um, that's also partly a political issue. So, you know, one of the there are many reasons for why the uh, for why the Israelis launched this attack. One of them is because the resistance is indeed growing, and because the resistance might pose a future threat. So this isn't something that necessarily is a propaganda point. Like there is indeed a, a certain level of capability that, uh, uh, that the resistance is gaining. But there's also a political component, which is that Israel wants to sort of, um, it wants to appease the hawkish right of the Israeli government, which has been calling, you know, for, for months now uh, for, um, uh, for a more sort of comprehensive reinvasion of Jenin and to, you know, root out quote unquote terror um, and to sort of not really be uh, burdened and encumbered by, you know, such considerations as, you know, um, committing war crimes or, you know, harm to civilians, etc. So that's the line of people like Ben Gavir and uh, Smotrich who have called for uh, an Operation Defensive Shield 2. Um, and so what the, what the army is trying to do is to partially satisfy them um, and that's why it put on a big show of destroying the camp. It was destroying the camp not because it had to, not because it even helped the army tactically against the resistance fighters. Part of it, it was, was just for show. Uh, to throw tear gas on fleeing, uh, on fleeing uh, civilians is not a tactical advantage. It's, it's to show that they terrorize the Palestinian population so that, uh, so that you know, the right will somewhat be satisfied. But something tells me that it'll never be enough. Yumna, help us understand the logistics and operations of these groups in the camp. What kind of weapons do they carry? What are these weapons production facilities Israel claims to have destroyed? Uh, you know, Janine is very close to the northern edge of the Green Line that demarcates the West Bank from what some might call uh, Israel proper, although Israel has no fixed or recognized borders there. Uh, how do these groups even carry out training exercises? I, I guess what I'm getting at here is that while they may be able to carry out a successful defense of an area like the Janine refugee camp, these groups are no match for the full Israeli military, even though the Israeli government describes them as uh, existential threats to the state. Yeah, when we're talking about just like the military capabilities of 
let's say, the Janine brigades versus the Israeli military. It's like comparing, I mean, it's, it's like apples and oranges. You can't even really compare it. Um, in terms of the source of the weapons, it said that, you know, the in terms of the firearms, and in the case of, and it's the same with many of the firearms that make its way into to the West Bank, is a lot of them are brought in through different, um, you know, weapons trade routes coming from inside Israel, and a lot of them coming actually from um, different Israeli security apparatuses or, or you know, old weapons that once um, belonged to to Israeli security forces. But the the weapons that are are held by these groups in Janine are largely, in terms of firearms, you see, you know, M16 rifles, some AK-47s, and pretty, um, pretty old, outdated weapons when comparing to the, you know, state-of-the-art tactical gear of the Israeli military, even in terms of just uh, defensive defensive gear and body armor. I mean, you've seen the photos, right? Like you have masked gunmen that are in jeans and t-shirts um, holding M16s or Kalashnikovs facing off against, you know, heavily armored Israeli military soldiers and, and vehicles. In terms of the weapons stores that Israel is saying um, that they have raided and confiscated and destroyed, if you look at the photos published by the Israeli military, um, you know, there's some some guns and 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 bullets that were confiscated. A lot of it is like homemade handmade IEDs and and explosives. So th- the weapons and the explosives and everything that's being used by the the groups in Janine against the Israeli military when the military is invading Janine are are very provisional when it when compared to the full force and power of the the Israeli military. Ferris, the Biden administration is pushing hard to expand the Abraham Accords, particularly with Saudi Arabia. That government issued a condemnation of the Israeli invasion, and uh, and Bahrain did as well. Morocco is delaying a conference of the states that signed the accords. Uh, the United Arab Emirates issued something less than a condemnation. What impact on the broader Middle East region do you see this violence having? Historically, it's Arab states that have spent money to rebuild refugee camps when Israel carries out an invasion. Do you think the economic ties Israel is building with some Arab states through the Abraham Accords is going to have any impact on its next steps? Well, I mean, I think that the Arab states were able to just throw money at the problem and then be able to continue in its normalization and betrayal of Palestinians, then they would do it. But uh, it it seems it's not so simple. Um, So I do think that you know, I mean, this chain of uh, of sort of Arab normalization has been ongoing for a while, and uh, you know, for a, for a while it was advancing sort of without a hitch, uh, largely because uh, they could sort of justify to themselves that they're dealing with a somewhat um, non-reactionary sort of uh, level-headed Israeli government, and you know, now with the current right-wing government. It's somewhat more uh, embarrassing for certain Arab states, but it also isn't something that would necessarily sort of um, impede them. Um, but it's also something. It also is going to have to do with the, you know, how things continue to develop. So, uh, and here it all has to do with the tension, the existing tension between the current government and the sort of reigning uh, liberal dominated establishment within the Israeli military. So the liberals in the military, they don't want to engage in the kind of um, relative indiscriminate use of force that the right is calling for. Of course, I mean, even the liberals by any normal person's standards are used uh, indiscriminate force as a matter of course. But you know, even that is not enough for the right wing. The right wing basically wants uh, genocide or short of that ethnic cleansing. Um, 
So the more that the right wing gains a foothold within Israeli politics, the harder it is for Arab states to justify their continued normalization with Israel. Even though at the end of the day, the um, these liberal governments might be even more effective in its carrying out of the the colonization of uh, Palestine in a way that would maintain what the uh, the Israeli army itself has called the status quo. Um, and it's actually something that's pretty interesting. There, there's this thin, think tank called the INSS. It's like an Israeli military think tank, and they put out a, an extensive report where um, they were sort of sounding the alarm for the threat to the status quo that the recent sort of right wing government might pose. And that status quo is described as being uh, sort of. Uh, a philosophy of rule that is about strategically utilizing military power and then soft power, um, uh, the carrot and the stick. And what they fear is that the Israeli right is only going to be using the stick and will do away with the carrot entirely. And that is something that will lead to what they call instability and be a security disaster for Israel. So... um, you know, uh, maybe it's not so bad in that sense <laughs> that the uh, the current right wing is in power. Um, so essentially, I think it really turns on this um, because if if we were to allow things to sort of proceed uh, uninterrupted uh, as they were before the right wing government took hold, I think Arab normalization would just continue without much of a hitch. But with one added caveat, which is that, you know, the regional role of um, the sort of the counter, uh, the countervailing in a regional forces, whether we're talking about, you know, uh, Iran or uh, or uh, Syria or Lebanon, etc., even though they're, you know, comparatively weak and they're all embroiled in their own sort of, uh, you know, have their own set of interests and are embroiled in their own struggles. But I still think that assessment holds. Yumna, I want to get your reaction to the role the Palestinian Authority and Mahmoud Abbas played over the last week. Uh, After the Israeli withdrawal, we saw scenes where Palestinians threw rocks at PA security forces. Um, Yesterday, Wednesday, when senior officials with the PA arrived to attend a funeral of some of the fighters in Janine, they were booed at and run off. How is the PA handling the aftermath of this attack? I think the PA is handling this the way that it's handled every other massive Israeli raid that it's been, you know, totally complicit in, in that as the raid was going on, we saw, you know, to the international facing part of the PA, we saw, you know, the usual statements of this is a crime, um, Israel's committing crimes, this needs to stop. You know, Abbas called for emergency meeting, an emergency meeting, which is just laughable because it's like, what are you, what are you meeting about? Um, because, you know, with PA security coordination with Israel, the PA is, is well aware of, of these raids and these invasions as they happen and, and ahead of time as well, because places like the Janine refugee camp are technically in area A of the West Bank that's under the full you know, jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority. There's long been a sense of disillusionment, disenchantment, frustration uh, with the PA, especially in areas like Janine. And that is directly related to this choice that a lot of these these young men take in when it comes to taking up arms against Israel, because they've been offered no sort of recourse by by their leaders. So when it comes to to the current raid, like you said, uh, the PA, when when PA affiliated officials went to offer condolences or, or showed up in the the aftermath of the raid, they were they were booed at and and um, essentially kicked out by by young people in Janine. And that just shows the level of frustration and that people feel and the total rejection of of the PA 
in Janine. And I think that, you know, we're going to continue to see that sentiment spread, especially because of how uh, significant of a role Janine and other centers of this resurging resistance, how important of a role they're playing amongst um, the Palestinian public opinion and the Palestinian youth across Gaza and the West Bank and and even in 48 and Jerusalem. Um, And so as long as Palestinians continue to see their leaders sitting by and twiddling their thumbs and, you know, offering platitudes while they're being slaughtered by the Israeli military, it just, it, it doesn't bode well for the PA. And right now it just seems like their strategy or lack of strategy is just to keep doing the same of, of what they have been doing. Lastly, what developments or trends are each of you watching for in the aftermath of this invasion? Are there going to be more large scale attacks on Palestinian cities? Uh, is the PA in any position to influence the Israeli government's actions? Uh, what, which factions inside the Israeli government have been strengthened or weakened uh, by these events and inside Palestine? Tarek, let's start with you in Gaza. People in Gaza are glad that this attack ended without eating Gaza in the middle of it and start bombing Gaza. I believe this will not be the last attack on Palestinians. These Israeli attacks will not stop as long as Israel is moving on and its policies and the ethnic cleansing they are committing against Palestinians with the international community protection. I think Israel is showing its power by invading some areas in Palestine knowing that no other place will fight because they destroyed Gaza one month earlier and Israel was sure that Gaza will not respond this time because Gaza is really recovering. But I also believe that these steps by Israel to separate and destroy Palestinians will work quite the opposite and strengthen Palestinians in all the areas and create a unity response. If we are not seeing this now, I'm sure that will happen very soon. I essentially agree with Tara on on this when it comes to uh, to the role of Gaza, um, uh, because as you know, as he mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Hamas, both Hamas and uh, the Islamic Jihad are reeling from from the last confrontation. But you know, it isn't to say that they wouldn't intervene, but it would require something else, maybe something relating to Al Aqsa. For them to intervene, and you know that indeed might happen, um, but this is something that actually uh, I think speaks to the situation in Jenin as well, because right now what you have in Gaza is that you have, you know, the establishment of a certain resistance presence in Gaza that um, essentially functions as a kind of partial deterrent against against Israeli action. So that means that Israel, you know isn't going to pummel Gaza without a certain calculus uh, as to what the Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad response will be. So that means is that they, uh, you know, it's not just a deterrence from the Israeli side. There's a mutual deterrence, even if it's more slanted in Israel's favor right now. And I think, you know, Munia, um, um, sorry, uh, Yumna had a had an explainer, had an article that came out uh, last, uh, that came out yesterday that talked about, you know, this phenomenon where Jenin could be the next Gaza in the sense that Jenin would become a sort of terrain that would be uh, in some senses hostile to uh, to Israeli advancement and will make it some and will it, it'll result in a sort of calculus on the Israelis part uh, as to whether they should enter or not in Israeli military and security parlance this is called operational freedom so the entire language of the operation has been couched in terms of uh, regaining operational freedom in Jenin because currently they've lost that operational freedom they can't go into Jenin easily without being assailed by gunfire without being led to ambushes without having their state of the art uh, military armored vehicles uh, blown up by IEDs they can't do that right now and this is one of the things that the operation sought to do um, did it do that well i'm not sure i don't i don't think it has at least fully because even though they confiscated you know they confiscated things they they, they didn't 
they didn't kill fighters. So the people, the brains behind this has not been uh, has not been taken out. So the resistance is very much alive. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you know it isn't in danger. It is. It's in a constant situation of war where things are not to its favor. But I think that the situation right now, uh, let's say that the resistance is in more of a position in strength now than it has been in a while. Um, and that is, again, I think related to the sort of combat maturity that I think we've been seeing, um, which is something that, you know, if you want to read more about it, uh, check out an article that we're going to be putting out later today, or depending on when this podcast runs, it might already be out. To answer your question about what we can what we can anticipate in terms of more Israeli operations and to Faris's point of the fact that, you know, the, the resistance is still very much alive. Israel has, has been open about the fact of what they want to achieve in Janin, which is what we, what we wrote about on the site is this Gaza type of model, this Bantustan where these unwanted Palestinians are, are caged in and Israel has free reign over what it can do. It can go in anytime, um, anywhere, anyhow, and, you know, kill fighters or kill whoever, extract um, weapons, etc. And the Israeli military establishment has been very clear about what their, you know, what their goals are with Janine in general. And they've said that this is this is not going to be the last um, operation of its kind and that Palestinians can expect more and more of these types of raids in Janine, um, maybe in the next few days, weeks or months, we're not sure. Uh, but it's clear that the Israeli military wants to adopt this sort of strategy of, as one of, as a political analyst and, and journalist told me yesterday, this, this doctrine of mowing the grass the same the same doctrine that they've applied in Gaza, which is you know engaging these unwanted p- Palestinians in an area, and once the the resistance maybe push the boundaries a little bit too far, Israel feels that you know they're they're going a little bit too strong or, or whatever it is, then Israel will just go back in, quote unquote, mow the lawn, go out, and, and then you know go back in the next time they feel that they need to to score any maybe political or or military wings depending on what the government is going through at the time. Thanks to our Palestine team for joining us today. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication with no paywalls. If you would like to support our work, go to mondoweiss.net slash donate. Please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find the show. Subscribe to one of our free email newsletters so you can stay up to date on events in Palestine and related politics here in the U.S. and around the world. Finally, if you have any more feedback, send me an email at dave at Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with a new episode.